Okay, well, welcome to another one of our Consensus Labs Hackathon Fireside Chats. With me today, we have Will Grant um, from Consensus, who is going to have a chat with us today about kind of the beginning of self-organizing teams um, in this new context of a remote 15 or 30 day hackathon. So Will, let's have you start by introducing yourself and just tell us a little bit about kind of your role at Consensus and, and your background and all that good stuff. Sure. So my role is I work with a team called Project DNA. Um, uh, we are a team that is formed to figure out how to make self-organizing work at Consensus, <clears throat> and also again, and, and also working on terms of governance and facilitation. So how to so when we say self-organizing, we mean that at the team level, but we also mean that up at the whole system level. Um, and you know, what Consensus is trying to do is often really unique. So we're trying to draw best practices from out in the world of self-organizing with consultants, and then also folks within the team who have got experience in different contexts with self organizing. Um, to say kind of my specific role is I tend to look a lot at governance and facilitation, like how do groups make decisions and how do groups work through complicated issues together, and then also a lot around team dynamics. Cool. And when you say teams at Consensus and then the teams that you're working with, can you just give us a ballpark for size that you work with in terms of teams? Depends on the team, right? So there's everything from small teams of like four or five. Um, we you know, sometimes work with the larger circles like labs, you know, worked with them on kind of working on what's happening with them organizationally and that was 30 people. Um, and then we're also consensus, like as a team as a whole, like we're now working closely with Joe on developing the new governance system, trying to figure out like, what's the infrastructure that allows for the maximum amount of self-organizing that an organization this large can have. Cool, so, so all you know, sizes. It's all sizes, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Okay, so as you can imagine, we have a bunch of new hackathon teams that are kind of forming right now and just starting to get down to brass tacks of, you know, actually hacking together and remotely and all over the world, different time zones, um, using tools like Discord, Slack to kind of stay in touch. Uh, and, and of course, like Gitcoin and GitHub as they're committing code. Um, I'd love you to just start sharing and I'll, I'll ask follow up questions as we dig in just kind of tips, guidelines, best practices for what a new team should look like. Hmm. I mean, so, you know, my answer to every question you're going to ask is it, it depends, right? Um, because, um, but just to say that, because, but that's really important for people to know because there's not hard and fast rules because um, I think you want to look at two things. The first is like, what's the, to be really clear on what's the goal you're trying to get, the way that I like to work with it is what's the goal that you're trying to get to and what are the necessary skills that you're going to need to have and to think about that at the first level and to see like, so what's the skill sets that we need. Um, and I would say that both in terms of technical skills, like, you know, we need coding in this kind of area, we need this experience, but also soft skills, like what are the kind of levels of organization that we need and the kind of the knowledge of the field and what areas are we going to bring in. And the first thing is just to map that so that it's not a floating area. And also because your team should figure out even you, you want to come to the same story of what skills you need. Right. Because one of the things is when people come from different backgrounds, they usually come with a lot of different assumptions about how things are going to work. And so what I found is that doing that um, kind of, you know, the skill analysis starts the first good conversation, which is, oh, Katie and I actually see this completely differently. Right. And it's like, first of all, do we even agree on the goal? Second of all, do we agree on how we reach the goal? The next thing, though, is especially in the early phases, there is no right answer, right? And that's, that's hard for people to hold, but it's really important, and it's actually really good design thinking to say there is no right answer because the right answer is, there, is the right team, but different teams can reach the same goal in very different ways. So the next thing is to kind of say, so that conversation of saying, okay, so here's how Katie views it. Here's how I view it. Oh, interesting. Why is there a difference? Right. And where is that difference maybe really productive and where could, you know, and let's find the areas. And my pattern is always find the areas of common ground first, name those, lock those down. So we got them right. Make sure it's common ground. Like we're not just using the same words, but meaning different things. So a good way to do that is to, you know, test it to say like, well, in this scenario, what would that mean? Right. So do a quick case study on it. Once you got the common ground, say, here's your area of differences. Why? But the thing to do is to then to look at that as not a problem, like, oh, God, this team's never going to work because diverse teams are the most creative teams if they can work through their diversity. So instead to say, okay, great, let's figure out why, what's coming from our background, what's our understanding of the problem, how does that all work together? And I think you'll get to some really productive conversations as you come to that agreement of the skill set you need. The next thing to say is you don't have to agree on everything. It's a 15 day team. And you may say, can there are ways that we can like maybe be more divergent as we go forward, but we're good with that. We know that we're doing it. We know that that might cause, you know, some, um, some additional work or some friction, but that's okay because we're experimenting and let's check in four days from now and just see how we're doing in relationship to that. Right. Um, so, 
So first thing is, so yeah, that's what I said. The first thing to do is to skill set, go into that. And then the next thing is, it's, this is hard to do on remote, so I'm not sure how effective this would be. But just to kind of, if people can even just say, really simply on a very personal level, this is how I like to work, right? So there's a phrase from facilitation that we call the designed alliance, which is we just say stuff like, you think about, well, what are the scenarios that we're likely to run into and how would we all like to handle that, right? So it's things like, I would like this to keep this majority on discourse. I really hate email. Like I actually am a person who needs to do like FaceTime with people like, and I'm willing to stay up late in order to do that. Some people will be like, do not contact me after 6 p.m. my local zone, right? Other people will be like, I'm a night owl, contact me whatever you want to. But just naming those things will, and, and people get clear on that. And it is kind of nice to have that written because you don't remember everything, but it just lets people say those things and get realized, okay, this is how our team is gonna work together, right? So that would be the initial stage that I would say in doing that. And I think, and then start to see how do you organize yourself based on those things. Yeah, I mean, you you just gave us a ton of rich information. So I want to kind of dig into a couple pieces. So first of all, it sounds like I love that you say there's no right answer, and that you know, of course, with 15 days, things can change, and they can even change in the span of 15 days. But what I did hear from you is it sounds like that there's some level of right amount of alignment inside the team mm -hmm. about the things that are going on. Does that does that sound like a good like a an accurate feedback to you? Yeah. I mean, you definitely want to, in some level, it's a gut check. Like if there's just so much misalignment in terms of what you think the goals are, how you're going to get there and how you like to work, like there may be a point where you're like, okay, this team isn't going to work unless we organize. Or you, know, you might have a team that goes like, we've got a broad tolerance for diversity and let's try it. But even just kind of naming that. And that's a tricky moment. It can feel a little vulnerable, but for people to feel like, notice it, people just get real around how they work how they work effectively. And so the ability to say like, yeah, it's, this is within my tolerance of alignment versus misalignment. But it, you know, uh, this will sound weird, but even if it's okay to be misaligned, as long as you're aligned on the fact that you're going to be misaligned. That makes sense. I, so yeah, I think it kind of come for me, it comes back to the concept of as long as everyone has stated their truth and they're aligned with what that is and, and at least it's all known, um, it seems like there's definitely a chance bigger than a chance that, that this can work. Right. So I really like that idea of just kind of the truth of it. Um, I think the goal piece is so important too, because I think often people come into hackathons, um, again, with that traditional hackathons, with this kind of 48 hour mentality of, I'm just here to learn, I'm just here to code. This 15 to 30 day time period is a little bit different because it's almost like the beginning of a company, not like the beginning of just kind of, let's practice our you know, solidity skills over the weekend, right? Um, and, and try something new. Um, so, yeah, I mean, can you comment a little bit on the difference between like, oh, this is just a team that needs to form for two days or three days versus this could be the beginning of a company that we're exploring together? Yeah. I mean, the first thing that comes up is like when I'm working with like, you know, I do a lot of weekend, like, you know, retreats and facilitation and stuff like that. And then my ability to put up with people for two days is really high. <laughs> like I can put up with just about anything for two days. And if I'm going to reach to the goal, I can get there. 15 days, uh, that's a little harder, you know? And so it's like, it is a thing of like knowing that it's going to be harder and that you're going to be moving so fast paced, there's going to be rubs, you know? Um, and so, um, to kind of actually, to name another thing that should get in there is an, uh, try to get some initial agreements on what do we do when we disagree with each other? How do we want to give feedback, right? How do you want to, how should I give feedback? How should we receive feedback? And creating it, like even within 15 days, you can get pretty clear pretty quickly on what's a good culture for that. Um, because the thing about a company and the thing about forming a team is that most of it comes down to feedback because that's where the learning comes from and the ability for people to be real. And again, some people would be like, look, if you're really going to give me hard feedback, I'd really appreciate it if you, you know, hit me up, we do it on the Zoom and we do it in person. And I also know that among a lot of engineers, their attitude is just kind of like, just give it to me straight and tell them what it is and I'll deal with it. Like no sugar coating, please. You know, but the problem is when people don't either say what that is or they don't really tell the truth because they think like, well, I ought to be tough enough to do it or I ought to be super nice. It's kind of like, no, really, how do I like to give it and receive it? Um, and that will help you get through the 15 days, right? Of checking stuff out. Um, 
So the next thing that I'd say is that in any 15 day arc, in any group arc, there's a, you know, a, a really basic formula that says that forms, that teams form, meaning that they organize initially, okay, this is what we're here and this is what we're gonna do. Then they norm, meaning they do this work of like, oh, this is how I'm going to, you know, th these are our norms. This is how we'll do feedback. This is how we're gonna communicate. This is, you know, our expectations around what we're doing in terms of repos, whatever's happening like, right? And then, then they're going to storm. And this is a key piece that people miss. It's like, and the storm means that they like, they're going to break apart and things are not gonna work. And then they reform, right? And the reason that's important is your team is not failing if they storm, right? In fact, the sooner you storm, probably the better off you are. If you, if you, if you formed, if you've normed, if you've actually got to be like, okay, we're working on this, right? But then there's some storms, you're gonna storm because what that is is that your initial ideas of what you're gonna be are all your ideas. It's like you have to run up, rub up against each other and have some friction. And then it's how well you work on that storm that determines the capability of your team. So if you just know that that, and that will happen over 15 days, over two days, maybe, maybe not. People can kind of let things glide. They can let things go. 15 days, you will storm. There's no question. The point is then how do you reform after that? Okay. Yeah. And so a good question here would be, can you talk about, you know, you said this happens in any kind of arc, which I think is, I completely agree. And the experience I've had with teams my, that I've been on, teams I've watched, completely have seen those four stages. Although I always, I always heard the last one called perform instead of reform, but maybe that's too <laughs> yeah. optimistic. Um, that's pretty optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. As soon as you're done storming, then you're performing, which is great. Um, can you give us a little bit of insight as to, so one kind of a two part question here. Are there breaths between these phases where you might be just yeah. struggling along? And, yeah. and then what percent of kind of the arc would you say is spent in each phase? Like if you're still forming on day eight, is that bad um, yeah. or does it really not matter? No, I think it matters. The, I think forming should be f the initial, f the other thing, by the way, is that you might do one arc where you might cycle through, right? You can actually, cause you know, that, that's why it's reform because by the way, once you reform, you inevitably, and then you'll create new norms around the new form and then you will restorm. Like that's how teams work. So and you never get out of the storms forever. You, you never get out of storms, <laughs> but what you do get, and this is really important, you get better and better at the storms. Like the teams that perform is like the, the storm gets that like, I've been in places where like, you know, storm sounds awful and you're blowing up, but you know, with a team that's really, you know, either really trust has developed trust over each other. You know, maybe we've been into some really serious arguments, but we got through it. What I'll notice every time is that then when it happens, people are like, oh, we actually, we've got the confidence that we did that pretty well last time. So then the level of which it just kind of, it's kind of that it feels hot or uncomfortable just drops and drops and drops. So storm, not within 15 days, unless you've got a, a team that has a lot of kind of, kind of just natural alignment. But storm can get to the point where it's kind of like, Katie, I really disagreed with uh, this direction. And you're like, oh, really? Tell me why. And go, blah, 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 blah. Okay, great. Like that, a storm can look like that if we're good at really listening to each other, being honest, being willing to change our minds and stick to our guns and figure something out, right? Right. It seems like so, if, you, if you get in the habit of not having to win them all, you can get through yeah. storms much totally. more efficiently. Yeah. A friend who teaches coders who started one of the first boot camps um, said that his definition of the coders that he likes to work with is that they know how to lose an argument. He's like, he considered it one of the primary things that a coder needs to do is to know how to lose an argument well. You know, um, so anyway, to go back onto it, yeah, you should be forming fairly quickly, and then the norming can chug along and go for along for a while. And it's the storm; it's hard to say. It's, um, but if you're spending days and days on a storm, you know, especially on a 15 day, and you just you're not reaching alignment, that's a really good moment to step all the way back and say, are we trying to pound through something? and drive through something that isn't ready to be resolved? What do we, if, if that keeps happening, you've missed something, right? There's something that's not being named and worked on, right? Whether it's um, an assumption about your goals, an assumption of your work process, um, an assumption about, you know, yeah, the best way to work as a team, like something's being missed. If you spent more than like, and it's hard, you know, the thing is that, you know, this kind of remote based, Nobody's in the same room. It's really hard to give time to this because it's also like how much time do people get to spend? Um, and also the other thing that I'll say is uh, remote is tricky because tone is difficult over text. Um, and yeah, so totally. If you can't get folks talking to each other and then even if you do Zoom, people don't have the same kind of just um, person to person emotional connection of knowing like, oh, I was really listened to. I can calm down. 
that's hard. So it's, it's hard to say in this, but it's like, if you're spending more than a couple of days storming on something and it doesn't feel like fun, by the way, storms can be fun. And you can check in and be like, I'm actually really enjoying this disagreement. Like, is it, where's everybody else? And if people are like, I am not. Okay, that's a problem. But if people are like, yeah, this is great. Cool, then your team style is storming, which, is a, which can be a team style, right? Yeah. But yeah, so to answer your question, a couple of days on each and then you should be back in, like a couple of days would be long if you're not able to resolve stuff. And then if that check in, slow down, see what you're missing, figure out why it's happening, try to resolve the root issue um, so that you can get back into work. Okay, cool. So you mentioned this a little bit and I think it's a very curious thing, um, this idea of remote teams. And it's, it's hard. I mean, I work remote, you work remote, obviously we, we live that life. Um, there's things that I feel like have made it better. Like when I am having a fight with someone, I actually sit further back from the computer. So there's more body yeah. language um, to play right. with. It, yeah. it actually makes a huge, That's difference. a huge difference. I hadn't thought of it and you're, I totally get it. Um, I think it freaks people out in the beginning. They're like, why are you sitting so far away from your computer? But there's something about like, sitting really close to someone right. that's really weird digitally and it's just you would yeah. never do that so the more that i can make it feel like yeah. we're actually physically together the better off i do right. um but the remote thing is hard and so the other thing that's been on my mind is that a lot of times with these having a bunch of different channels like email or discord or slack or like these different places you wind up with a lot of radio silence um and I think that is almost worse than, or certainly for me is worse than storming, right? Because then I'm wondering, what are people doing? Are they working? Are they leaving our team for another team? Are they doing something else? Uh, is there a way to kind of solve for that? Because I think the other thing here is that part of the reason we're doing this this way, this remote kind of remote first, um, is to be inclusive, right? Like you might have kids and you might have just celebrated the holiday weekend and okay. been with family and not been online for two straight days. And that's totally okay. That's what we're trying to get to here is people that can't necessarily go to a 48 hour weekend hackathon for whatever reason, right? Um, but at the same time, I think kind of the, the ambiguity of silence, especially digital silence is very scary for teams. Um, so can you speak to that a little bit or any, any best practices yeah. you've seen? Yeah. Work it's, yeah, it's a couple of ideas for what to do. The first is that that's where, when I, what I call the designed alliance at the beginning um, and kind of naming some of the things and kind of saying how often should we expect to communicate, right? Um, and um, would be one thing. And so clear cadence in terms of that. Um, the next thing is if there is radio, and, and I think that I would say you wanna check in, you wanna focus on the coding, but like set aside time for just checking team process. And what you can do is take your designed alliance, which is your agreements of how you're gonna to work together. And every couple of days, maybe, and I'm making this up off the top of my head because I haven't done one of these or like, you know, you know, facilitated teams doing it, but like three times during the course of your 15 days, like, you know, maybe about every four or five days, pause and say like, let's check on our designed alliance. Let's check on our work process. Let's, we've been talking about the work we've been doing. That's the what, let's talk about the how, right? And how's this going for folks? Right, around, right amount of communication, do you need more, do you need less? Like, are, are, are we using the right channels? Like, is this course actually working for you folks? You know, are you, how are our meetings, if we're meeting on Zoom, like good, bad, like, you know, like you spend a little bit of time. Um, oh, checking like a retro. On a basis. Yeah, it's basically, basically you're doing little internal retros as you go forward, yeah. So I, I would do that. Um, and with a sense, and the focus is, we're trying to figure out how to work together over 15 days. We're not trying to, we're not trying to form a company right? We're trying to work, we're just trying to get through the, I would say like, that's the beauty of it. It's only 15 days, right? Um, so we don't need to go super deep on things, right? If it's not really blocking us, then if, you know, you can just ask the question, is this big enough to block our work or is this something that we can live with, right? And then, um, and I'll say like, yeah, like we're not, <laughs> we're not getting married. We're working together for 15 days. So like, what can we let go and what, but what do we need to think genuinely, what's the blocker? Um, so I think if you, the other thing is the trap is that teams, so many teams, like 95% of the teams that I work with, feel that if they need to talk about their process, then something is broken. And I would say that's kind of like saying, I ate a meal. Why are there all these dishes in the sink? What is broken in my system? It's like, it's not. It's like, it's just, it's housekeeping, you know? And it's that kind of thing, like if you make the agreements and say like, you should expect to spend at least like you should expect to spend at least a couple of hours a week just cleaning up the team process, but with the very strict goal that this is 
to increase your performance. It is not to solve anybody's issues. It is not to make people like each other. It is not to be deep life learning experiences. You know, it is, it is not, it's not to like, it's, it should be an adult to adult conversation of how we work together more effectively. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know on my own team, like here, the labs design team, which is based all co-located in Colorado, we do a lot of retros and that really has helped us kind of check in all the time. And, and yeah. when we don't, I'm actually thinking that we haven't done one in a couple months and it's, it's overdue. So um, it's important to keep doing it. When we're doing it, we're definitely a healthier team. So I'm yeah. with you on that. Yeah. Let me, hold on. There was one thing I wanted to say about that for a sec. Um, I may lose it. Doing the retros, colo, no, lost it. Okay. Okay. Well, if it comes back, just stop me. Okay. Um, that's actually a good segue into kind of this, this discussion about, you know, different teams have, everyone that comes into a team has a different set of skills, right? Um, do you have best practices around how an individual, for example, might recognize what some of their skills, strengths and weaknesses are? And then on top of that, kind of being able to look, you talked about this a little bit at the beginning, but being able to look team wide and see, okay, we, we clearly have a deficit in XYZ skill, or we have, what I, I find more common is, is that we actually have two or three people that have overlapping skills and somehow it's actually causing more friction than not to have people, um, be be good at the same thing because it for me and my experience it actually seems to slow the team down almost whereas if it's like oh you're the designer and we don't have any other designers on the team you make the design decisions and we won't question them that that actually is like very carte blanche compared to there's four designers on the team of 10 and all of a sudden all of us have to be involved in every decision so how do you kind of articulate individual skills and then kind of the mesh of a team um kind of negotiating who gets to who gets to make decisions on those kinds of things Yep. Um, <clears throat> I remember what I was going to say, and it a little bit sets up actually this, this next piece. Um, it, was a, it was a piece of wisdom from Chris McKibben, you know, who works at, in consensus that he said, he was like, um, and he's worked with tons of software teams. He was the COO for Electronic Arts for a decade. And one of the things he said that he, that he said about feedback, he said, feedback is never about what's, what already happened. It's only about improving performance for the future. And that seems so simple, but I was like, right, it's not about Katie, you were wrong and I need you to acknowledge that you were wrong, you know, because that was a bad decision. You know, that's, that's backwards looking forward looking is this didn't work out. Let's figure out why and let's figure out what we're going to do next. Because if we're just like what you what we could do better together, there's, it's, it's a lot less of an emotional ask for you to admit your, you know, your sins. Um, so yeah. Um, so the piece that I'd say is, um, and I think that goes, and th this is the tricky piece about skill sets because it's, it's self-evaluation of what my skill sets really are and how good I really am can be tricky without some kind of objective measure to, to hold it against, right? So first, I agree with you, having several people who have overlapping skills is difficult, also because then people often have different, even if they're within the same area, they might have very different approaches to how they do it, right? And so you're kind of tripping over each other in terms of making decisions. People have their personal work styles and their skill sets. Um, the next is getting honest evaluation of what people's skill sets are it is hard. Um, and it's, um, and, the, and that's why the, the way to do it is, you know, I would say, and again, I'm, 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 I'm thinking about how I would do it if I was on a 15 day team, I would want to do the skills inventory. Right. And then I would want to, but not go in too deeply, but I think a good question is to be like, can you give me examples of where you have used that skill? Right. So it's not just, I'm great at this. It's I'm great at this. I've done this it's because then that tells me a little bit more about context, right? Like, Oh yeah, I was working with multiple startups and did that. Oh, I worked at Google and I did very different context, same skill sets. Right. So it's, um, and also the concreteness lets me listen to the sense of like, well, what experience did like, even just the stories that somebody tells about their experience tells me a lot about their skill set and how they do stuff and really what I think the real actual level of skill is. But don't try to figure it out. Don't try to grill it down too much. You're getting a broad sense and then get into work and then do quick retros and do quick sprints so that you can all get a sense of what, what skills you really do have and what skills you don't have, you know? Um, so get out there, prototype fast, get some stuff up, get everybody working, check out everybody's work. So like do a, you know, start it at the beginning so you've got a framework, but it's not, you're not gonna know anything until you actually do work together. Yep. It's actually a great segue into our last question, um, which is 
you know, when and how should a team be thinking, especially when we're, because one of the goals of this hackathon is to be broad, to go global, to let anybody who maybe, like I said, can't travel to a 48 hour hackathon in Kansas City or whatever, yeah. be involved. Um, that presents new problems on like people speaking different languages and having different backgrounds and being different time zones and having different life commitments and all that kind of stuff. How can the team be thinking about things like diversity and inclusion kind of from the beginning um, with these kinds of practices that you're already talking about? I can already see how some of the kind of norming pieces would actually be helpful to kind of yeah. establish, for example, like we need to have communication channels for introverts and extroverts. We need to have um, respect for the fact that some people will be sleeping when we're doing our stand-ups. But, you know, I know consensus struggles with this too, having a global population and, and you know, things like our uh, like sacred calls that we have with the whole company, but they are generally US based time zones, right? And it's like, how do you start thinking about some of that stuff for a team? Again, like we're talking about a 15 day window, so it's not making a major commitment just yet, but at the same time, it's on your radar. Um, yeah, what, what are your thoughts there? <laughs> So what you're saying is take all the problems of running an entire company, but the company only lasts for 15 days. <laughs> I, I thought I was giving you an out, but you know, you could also, you could also do it for forever too. That's fine. Yeah, it's tough. And, um, you know, light touch and being willing to kind of flex is going to be the first thing is just going to be mindset for me. It's like light touch, willing to flex. It's a sprint. Things are going to, we're going to, we're going to screw up a lot. Right. It's like, you know, it's, it's like anything you're getting together and trying it for the first time, there's going to be a ton of mistakes and it is still a learning process, right? Um, so the first thing is that mindset. The second thing is that the mindset that I, would, that, I, that I would encourage folks to have is I'm actually interested in working with people who are really different than me because I want to figure out how they work and what I learn from working with them. So somebody, every, each person individually tracking their own process of great, this is how I do my work. I'm super curious about how other people do their work because the best kind of coder is the coder who can work with a lot of other people, right? And so that, a, and, and, and designer and everything else, not just coder, but everybody. It's like, and so, and, you know, startups are fast and hard. And it's, you know, and so like that, this is, this is good practice on just noticing your own way of, what are the things that you are willing to be flexible on? What are the things that you actually discover are your non-negotiables? Totally. Yeah, there's um, a lot of kind of like self-learning that's happening mm -hmm. in this process. Because if you really know yourself on that, then you can go into a process. You can see how a team arranging is. You can be like, yeah, I can work with this. Or I really can't work with this, but I know specifically why I can't. Right? And being able to articulate that is important. In terms of, you know, and then in terms of diversity, I mean, that's one of the things. Like the core skill um, is is the capability to sit in a difficult situation and stay present. Meaning that I am present with the stuff that is annoying me, but I'm not being taken over by it. And, um, or that is really angering me or that I don't understand. And I'm good. I'm like, okay, I'm present with this. And I can actually be in a conversation with somebody who I should always remember is in just as much of their own process around things that they don't understand is difficult for them or is even angering them. And it's like that ability to hang in that space and just let it be okay that there are these differences and to say like, what's the best common ground we can find here, right? That lets us get through like the next two days. Let's just try this for two days, you know? And if it doesn't work, then we'll try another way, you know? Um, so I, I think in terms of, so to say like other stuff I've been talking about practices, but I think in terms of when you really get down to it, it's your own individual kind of work of sitting in a difficult situation, letting it hang, knowing what you can't deal with, knowing what you can deal with, and then being, being able to communicate that, right? And again, not asking for therapy, but just to say, like, this is what I need to get through the next three days and to hit this goal, you know? Totally. And to take it in bite-sized pieces and not try to solve everything all at once. I love that. Yep. We are coming to the end of our time. Last thing I'll ask you, this is a short question, not anywhere near as hard as the last question I asked you, um, is do you have any resources that you'd point people to in terms of like getting started with self-organizing stuff? Um, I can include them if you wanna send them over, I can include them on kind of a link that shares out to the, to the video, but if you have a couple you wanna mention or anything that you just find is a great resource for people to check out, love to hear about it. Yeah. So one thing I can, I can, one thing I did is I started a little library of my favorite articles on self-organizing, which is a Google doc that's available within consensus. So I can give that, um, that can be cut and pasted into an open doc. Um, the second thing is, um, 
You know, I'll say that actually, I actually think that there's a lack of really good resources for kind of starter kits for self-organizing. You know, everybody knows, you know, reinventing organizations. Um, but it's, it's actually not, a, it's a great aspirational book. It's not a good book to know how to actually build anything. Right. First day on the job kind of book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, so in terms of stuff, I mean, I'm going to offer an idea for a, a book on this which I would just recommend that anybody read who's, who's going to have a job. <laughs> so I'd say it's kind of worth your time. <laughs> and it's called Overcoming the Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. Um, yeah, that's a great book. It's, um, and it's because he's, it's the best analysis of what makes teams work and how you get it. And, and it's, it, he shows it's, it's really pragmatic is one of the things that I really like about it. Um, and he says, like, there's kind of five levels that you need to go through in order to be able to get results. Totally. I hesitated on that because I'm a little like, I, you know, you're not going to implement a lot of that stuff over the course of 15 days. But if you even just know the framework, I think it can help you analyze what the problems, um, like what are the problems, like you can analyze the dysfunction. You can be like, oh, our problem is actually like, we're not willing to be, you know, in conflict. So then it says, well, then this is kind of what you do with that. Yeah, I, I, Jake is calling out in the chat that the head of labs actually loves that book and he recommends yeah. it all the time. I've, I've read that book in my career before as well. It's a, it's a winner for sure. And I agree, like it's, it's less of a read this quick pamphlet on how to make your team work for the next 15 days and more about if you plan on working with others in your life, you should probably, <laughs> right. probably check this book out. If you're planning to have a job with a human who's on the team, yeah. Um, and then, um, and then the thing that I would also say is, if I can put a plug in, and this is like, I don't know if this is you know, relevant for this, but you know, we've, DNA hosts self-organizing trainings, and if folks are operating within consensus, take one of those. You know? we do yep. the self, it's called Self-Organizing 101. Um, and I can also, you know, Katie, I'll just say we can, you may want to have one of these conversations with some of the teachers in the Self-Organizing 101 as well. Cool. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, Will, thank you so much for taking the time to chat out with us. This has been super enlightening. And I, I feel like I learned a lot to put in practice with my own team, which is a win-win. And uh, I'm sure our hackathon teams will be very grateful. So thanks so much for taking the time. Welcome. Thanks. Bye.